So let me start my talk with a refreshing movie clip. As we all agree, our brain is staggeringly complex. It consists of 80 billion neurons with many distinct cell types. Furthermore, each neuron makes thousands of different connections with other neurons forming an interesting neural network. So we neuroscientists ultimately ask how the neural network produces functional outcomes such as cognition, emotion, motivation, and bodily responses. And how is this function leads to neurological and psychiatric disorders? One of the primary goals of neuroscience is to map the entire anatomical connectivity in the neural network and to identify the function of each neural circuit element. There is a technique that renders an intact biological tissue um, optically clear and uh, permeable to macromolecules. So it holds a great potential for high throughput analysis of brain structure and molecular phenotyping. So I was fortunate to familiarize myself to two cutting edge techniques and apply to neuroscience. And so my talk today, first part, will mostly concentrate on my PhD work on optogenetic dissection of the anxiety circuitry. And then I'll briefly go over um, our ongoing work on clarity and um, the new technologies that we have been developing under that. So it all started with a breakthrough made in Kansai back in 2007 and it was actually 2005. And I was an undergrad majoring in chemistry and when I first saw this, brain so on of switch and I just became totally fascinated and started to study neurobiology and work in neuroscience labs. And um, this eventually led me to the doctoral that I did as a graduate student. So in the next of them, I studied anxiety circuitry. When what is anxiety? Anxiety can be thought of as a sustained state of heightened apprehension in the absence of specific um, and predictable and immediate threat. And obviously, anxiety is an adaptive state that is critical for an organism to survive under unpredictable risks. But it can become maladaptive and severely debilitating. About 28% of adults will experience anxiety disorders at some point in their lives, a very high proportion of people. And certainly, anxiety disorders show very high comorbidity with other diseases such as depression, addiction, and OCD, and even some neurological diseases such as autism. Um, however, available treatments are often ineffective and induce severe side effects. For example, the azepam, a benzodiazepine drug, um, is known to be addictive and can induce cognitive impairment as well as respiratory suppression. So all of these point to the need for a deeper understanding of the anxiety circuitry in the mammalian brain. So this is the previous model of anxiety circuitry based on numerous studies employing lesion, pharmacology, and um, electrical stimulation. And it was suggested that the via basolateral amygdala sends projections to the, both the central amygdala and the nucleus of the striatumnalis, or the BNST, to trigger the expression of fear and anxiety. And just to give you some more anatomical context. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Is it working now? Yeah. Yeah? All right. Um, so just to give you some more anatomical context, um, the central amygdala and the BNST belong to a superstructure so-called the uh, extended amygdala uh, that refers to the continuum of structures um, that share similar cellular morphology, neurochemical makeup, and input and output structures. Um, so the idea of this model is that the both central amygdala and the BNST receives relevant sensory and environmental information from the BLA and projects down to the um, shared the downstream structures in the brainstem and hypothalamus to elicit the expression of anxiety and fear. And as you can see, this is a very simple and straightforward model that everybody would like, but as we all know, nat nature is always, always more complicated than that. So that's um, what I'm going to show you today, and let's first focus on the amygdala. So the anatomy and the function of amygdala circuits in fear have been extensively dissected, but the function of their, uh, these circuits in anxiety has been unclear. So it is well established that the BLA and the central amygdala plays critical roles in fear expression. So it is known that BLA neurons are mostly glutaratergic, whereas central amygdala neurons are mostly gabaergic, and the central amygdala can be further subdivided into the lateral and medial divisions, where the medial division is thought to be the primary output structure of the amygdala. Now the majority of the sensory information comes into the BLA, which in turn projects to CL, CL and CN. And we know that CL inhibits the CN. So putting all these pieces together, we hypothesize that the BLA projections to the CL would elicit feed forward inhibition onto the CN and thereby decreasing anxiety and fear expression. So to test this hypothesis, 
hypothesis, we first express channel dioxin in the basal lateral amygdala and deliver that on top of the central amygdala to preferentially stimulate the VLA projections to the CL. And to assess the animal's anxiety during these optogenetic manipulations, we perform the elevator close maze test and the open field test, which are the two most widely used anxiety assays for rodents. <coughs> So mice have inherent desire to um, explore a novel environment to find food and mating partners, but at, at the same time, it also tends to avoid um, height and open spaces that's associated with potential, potential danger and predators. So that's why the increased time spent in open arms of the EPM or center of the open field arena is interpreted as lower anxiety. And indeed, anxiolytic drugs are shown to increase open space explorations in both assays. So I've always done these tests in pair, and I always got the same results. So just to save time, I'll show you the data from EPM only today. So we ran the mice on the EPM test for 15 minutes and applied the laser stimulation only for the five minutes in the middle of the session. And we observed a very strong and reversible anxiolytic effect. So now EIP control mice did not show such effect. And um, to just to clarify this notation, it means that we targeted the BLA to CA projection with channel adoption. So exciting this circuitry. UIP is a, just a control. We also <coughs> stimulated the entire BLA cell bodies, which activated all BLA pyramidal neurons non-specifically. And it, it, it elicited an anxiogenic effect, which agrees with the most previous literature. So our precise optogenetic approach unexpectedly revealed a certain neural circuit um, element in the BLA that plays an, an anxiolytic role. Um, this necessity experiment tells us that this projection is actually physiologically relevant to anxiety expression. So in summary, we have shown that the BLA to CL projection reduces anxiety-like behavior, and one possible mechanism is via feedforward inhibition of the CM um, output neurons. And we have also shown that um, by slice patch clamp exp uh, experiment, Stimulating BLA fibers in the CAO activated the postsynaptic CAO neurons and um, inhibited the CM neurons. And um, interestingly, when we directly stimulated the BLA fibers in the CM, that activated the postsynaptic CM neurons. And this would presumably increase anxiety. So in the future, it will be interesting to see whether this projection actually increases anxiety and whether the balance between these two pathways would determine the overall anxiety level. So that was the work that I've done with Kei Tai here. Um, but this is certainly only a part of the anxiety circuitry. One reason is that anxiety is a, actually a very complex behavior state that consists of multiple features that are governed by many brain structures. For example, when you play poker, you don't really want to lose the money, but chances are slim. You may become really anxious. Uh, you probably don't want to do anything risky. Um, you probably just want to walk away from the situation and you might start breathing faster, and so on. So all of these changes are coordinated by diverse modalities of the nervous system output. But how is a behavior, behavior state assembled from these diverse features? How are these diverse features coherently modulated? This sounds like a complex question, but we have a good guess. So we know that many of these individual features are modulated by brain, uh, brain uh, structures in the brainstem and hypothalamus. So it was conceivable that there is a coordinating brain center that gives commands to all these downstream projections to um, coherently modulate the anxiety state. So the BNST might be such a coordinating um, region for the anxious state because it projects to all those downstream projection uh, downstream regions, and it, it is thought to play a critical role in anxiety. Now, what is BNST? It's um, bed nucleus of the striatum terminalis. It's located in the ventral medial basal forebrain. Um, it is known to uh, mediate uh, defensive behaviors in both humans and rodents. For example, human fMRI studies have shown that activity in the BNST is increased upon threatening stimuli, and this, is, this response is exaggerated in the patients of anxiety disorders. And a lot of mouse behavior studies have also implicated the BNST and anxiety. So intra-BNST injection of CGRP and CRH or CRF um, to neuro neuropeptides that are involved in stress-related behavior uh, elicited anxiogenic behavior in mice and, and the EPM test. So based on numerous um, previous literature, it was suggested that the BNST activity would increase anxiety and the major source of excitation um, is the BLA. 
But um, these are like inferred from lesion studies, and there, there has not been um, direct test of these studies. And we had the tools to test it in the lab, so I set out to test this hypothesis. So I first started by replicating other people's data using pharmacology. We, here we infused glutaromatergic receptor antagonists into the BNST and observed increased open space exploration without effect in locomotor per se. So um, this is consistent with what is previously reported. And we next tried the same experiment with optogenetics. So here we expressed heterodopsin in the BNST and inhibited them. And we observed the same anxiolytic effect. And the opposite manipulation with heterodopsin elicited the opposite anxiogenic effect. So these results indicate that the activity in the entire BNST is anxiogenic in agreement with the previous hypothesis. But if we carefully think about it, what we are really measuring um, with the EPN and OFT test is behavioral risk avoidance against open spaces, which is certainly a part of the anxious state, but does not quite capture the entire state. So how about other aspect, aspect of the anxious state? How about physiological sign of anxiety? So we then focused on respiration. Now, hyperventilation is linked to higher anxiety in both humans and rodents, as I um, replicated in my hand here. So in my hand, mice breath breathed faster in the open field compared to home cage. And it is also clinically relevant. For example, a short respiration is a prominent symptom of panic disorder. And stimulating the BNST somata happens that it increases the respiratory rate. And, the previous, and from the previous slide, you might remember that the same manipulation increased the risk of avoidance behavior in both EPM and OFT. So these results suggest that, again, overall activity in the BNST promotes anxiety, consistent with most previous literatures, and can modulate both behavioral and physiological features of the anxious state. However, BNST is not just a simple mass of brain tissue. Anatomical studies have defined more than 20 subnuclei in this brain structure. It's remarkable. And they, it's, it's swarming. It, there are so many neuropeptides involved in this structure. Um, and um, electrical stimulation of different subparts of the BNST elicited opposite effects in arterial pressure. So apparently, the BNST is one of the most anatomically and functionally heterogeneous brain regions. Then we noted that the oval nucleus of the BNST, or the oval BNST, um, there are a lot of different notations, but um, it looks oval, expresses a very high level of corticotropin releasing hormone. And importantly, the corticotropin releasing hormone is a uh, straight related hormone that increases anxiety when injected into the BNST. So we hypothesized that activity in the oval BNST would increase anxiety. So indeed, um, we expressed oval, uh, heterodopsin in the oval BNST using a dopamine receptor free driver line and inhibited the oval BNST and observed an anxiolytic effect um, in, both, in terms of both risk avoidance behavior and also the respiratory rate. The opposite manipulations with heterodopsin elicited the opposite behavior, increased risk avoidance behavior and respiratory rate. Um, Next, we targeted the BLA projections to the BNST as it was thought to be the major anxiety pathway. And interestingly, we observed that BLA fibers terminated in the region of the BNST that is not oval BNST. So we defined the other regions of the BNST as the anterodorsal BNST or the AD BNST. And it turns out that there are many previous an an anatomy studies um, that have already shown that um, BLA does not project to the oval BNST. So we showed that overall BNST activity increases anxiety, and now we are asking the function of this projection, the ADBNST-associated activity. And according to the previous hypothesis, this should increase anxiety. But that's the opposite of what we observed. So when we inhibited this projection with heterodopsin, we observed increased anxiety-like behaviors. Um, and conversely, stimulating this projection elicited opposite effect in both sets of tests. So these data reveal that the two BNST subregions play the opposite roles, oval BNST increasing anxiety and the, while the recruitment of the AD BNST is anxiolytic. And both BNST subregions can control multiple features of the anxious state. Uh, and we next characterized the relevant BNST circuitry with electrophysiology. So we first developed a microdrive containing eight stereotrodes surrounding an optic fiber for simultaneous recording and light delivery. And um, this was implanted to the BNST of the mice that were expressing channel in the BLA. And the stereotrode is just like tetrode, so you can isolate single units from um, the recording. 
Because we are stimulating glutamatergic BLA axon terminals, we expected excitatory responses from the postsynaptic BNST neurons. And indeed, we observed excitation from the majority of the um, light responsive ADBNC single units. And consistent with this, a uh, corresponding wholesale patch clamp recording, um, here we are patching from the ADBNC neurons while stimulating BLA fibers. And this showed that excitation um, is observed in most of the light responsive cells. Um, however, in the voltage clamp experiment, experiment, we detected the presence of both excitatory and inhibitory inputs, or EPSCs and IPSCs. And we demonstrated that these IPSCs are mediated by uh, local ADBNC interneurons using multiple experiments. First of all, we targeted glutamatergic BLA um, projection so that the inhibitory re responses should be mediated by something. And the EPSCs were shorter than the IPSCs, suggesting that the IPSC came through one more synapse. And beta application of glutamatergic receptor antagonists abolished both EPSCs and IPSCs, whereas beta application of picrotoxin, a GABA A receptor blocker, abolished only IPSCs. So these results indicate that the BLA provides both direct, direct excitation to and, and illicit feed forward inhibition onto the ADBNST neurons. We also found several lines of evidence for recurrent excitation, as shown here by doublets of VPSC peaks, or sustained excitation in response to a single light pulse or light pulse train, or even to a very short um, electrical pulse. So this patch claim experiment in vivo recording and calcium imaging so there are lots of data uh, to support this. So based on these data, um, we propose a circuit model where the BLA afferents elicit direct excitation in the ADBNST and also elicit recurrent activity. We then next studied the circuit relationship between the OVO BNST and the ADBNST. And previously, we observed the opposite function of the OVO and AD. So we consider that two subregions might, play, uh, might inhibit the, uh, each other since such a circuitry, circuitry would, it, would enable efficient flip-flop-like switching between high and low anxiety states. So to answer this question, we first investigated the OVO-BNST to ADBNC circuitry by expressing uh, terminal often in the OVO-BNST and patching from the ADBNC neurons while stimulating their OVO-BNC terminals. And there was mixed responses, excitatory and inhibitory, um, in both, patch, uh, both voltage and current clamp uh, experiments. But the, as you can see, the excitatory responses are small, and most of the responses are in inhibition. So we concluded that the OVO BNST mostly inhibits the AD BNST. How about the other way around? So um, it is already actually known that previous anatomy papers uh, uh, that uh, they have shown that the AD BNST scarcely projects to the OVO BNST. And we further confirmed this with our hand. So we injected rabies virus carrying EGFP into the OVO BNST, and rabies virus is a retrograde tracer. So all the neurons projecting to the injection site or the OVO BNST will be labeled with GFP. And um, indeed, we did not observe any GFP neurons in the AD BNST. So these results suggest that the OVO BNST inhibits the AD BNST, while the AD BNST does not influence the OVO BNST as much. And now we know that the stimulating the BLA to ADBNC projection reduces both risk of avoidance and respiratory rate. So we then next asked which outputs from the ADBNST would implement these effects. We tried stimulating six different downstream projections, and three of them had no effect in all of our measurements. So I'll show you the data from the other three that showed some um, uh, significant effect. So for these projections, we also decided to add a behavior measure of um, subjective preference, which is real-time place preference test. So in this assay, mouse is allowed to explore freely the two chambers, but only one chamber is paired with electro, uh, optogenetic stimulation. So if the, like, if the mouse likes the stimulation, then it will spend more time here. So um, with the addition of real-time place preference test, or RTPP, we can measure three components of the anxious state from mice. Risk avoidance using EPM and OFT, and we can measure the respiratory rate and subjective preference using RTPP. So just to make a long story short, these are all the data from the experiment, which shows a very nice tri triple dissociation. Um, ADBNC projections to the lateral hypothalamus, parabrachial nucleus, and the ventral tegmental area implemented three features of the um, anxiolysis. 
um, reduced risk of avoidance, reduced respiration, and increased emotional valence. Um, these three features seem to be separable and also independent. So this table also summarizes this, um, our behavior data showing nice triple dissociation. And interestingly, the BLA to ADBNC projection, which is at the one step upstream of these three projections, was able to modulate two of these features, but not one. So this points to the complexity of the circuitry. So together, these data all suggest that stimulating to, um, the BLA to ADBNC projection activates ADBNC output neurons to drive a low anxiety state via multiple ADBNC efferents that individually modulate distinct aspects of the anxious state. And we found recurrent activity in the ADBNC, which may be needed to recruit neurons projecting to distinct target regions. And the oval BNST may increase anxiety by inhibiting the ADBNST neurons, or maybe by directly projecting to other um, downstream structures. So if the ADBNST plays such a central role in reducing anxiety, we should be able to see ADBNST single and multi-unit activity um, encoding anxiety-like features during behavior. So then we next um, probe the neural activity from the ADBNST um, using the stereotrode arrays during the EPM uh, assay. So indeed, at the multi-unit level, the greater ADBNST activity was observed in closed arms of the EPM, which is a safer environment. And this scatter plot shows that actually every single multi-unit recording that we have performed showed higher um, firing rate in the closed arms. And um, yeah, just to confirm this, we also recorded uh, from the ADBNST during this light dark box test, which is another assay of anxiety. So here the dark compartment is the safer environment. And again, we observed higher ADBNST activity in the darker compartment. So it seems like ADBNST neurons are activated when the environment is safe and then can causally decrease anxiety as we have shown with the behavior, um, causal behavior studies. At the single unit level, many units preferentially fired in the closed arms of the EPM, um, while some other units did not show such preference. And so this is the plot of normalized firing rate in different zones of the EPM. And to quantify the extent to which single units differentiated between closed and open arms, we defined a metric we named e EPM score, in which a positive score that's closer to one indicates that the normalized firing rates are similar between arms of the same type, but different across arms of the different type. So intuitively, what, what this means is that if, if the EPM score is high, that it means that the single unit can distinguish the two different environments. And the EPM, if the EPM score is closer to zero or negative, that it means that the single unit cannot distinguish the um, environment. So. Um, now we know that the BLA is the major source of um, excitation to the ADBNST. So what's, we then ask what's going to happen when we block the BLA input to the ADBNST. Would, would these single units still be able to distinguish um, open and closed arms? So to do this, uh, we ran the mice on EPM for 20 minutes with alternating light off and on epochs to allow the comp computation of EPM scores for every single uh, unit um, for both light off and on epochs. And strikingly, inhibition of BLA inputs decreased EPM score in most of the units. And this red dotted unit is a dramatic example. So this unit was perfectly able to distinguish safe and anxiogenic environment, but upon shutting off the BLA inputs, it cannot, it lost the ability to distinguish the environment. So, um, and this is the group data showing the significant um, decrease in EPM score from all of our single units. So um, yeah, it seems like inhibiting the BLA uh, input um, blocks the incoming information about the environment. So just to summarize all of our findings, we discovered that a oval BNST increases anxiety, and surprisingly, AD BNST decreases anxiety. But both regions were able to coherently modulate behavior and physiological features of the anxious state. And we found that distinct projections arising from the BNST orchestrate uh, modulation of different features of the anxious state. And the coordination of recruiting all these projections may be facilitated by recurrent activity here. And ADBNST neurons were able to distinguish safe and anxiogenic environments. And this feature depended on the BLA inputs, at least partially. 
So our data highlighted a critical role of the BNST and anxiety and um, point to the complexity of the anxious state control in the mammalian brain. So although we have extensively dissected the anxiety circuitry, it raises many further interesting questions, just to list a few. Now, is the BNST really the anxiety center, or are there upstream regions that provide information to the BNST, or is it more like distributed neural circuitry? And how does the BNST act in concert with other structures like central amygdala or the prefrontal cortex or hippocampus? And what's the, what are their neurochemical compositions? How, does, um, how do neuromodulators like dopamine, serotonin, or acetylcholine affect the, uh, the circuitry here? And do they express unique molecular markers to allow pharmacological interventions of different circuit populations? And the, where does the circuitry diverge and converge? For example, do the BLA neurons projecting to CAO and the ADBNST, are they the same neurons or different neurons? Do BLA and a oval BNC neurons converge on the same ADBNC neurons or different ADBNC neurons? So these are all critical <coughs> questions to, um, for us to understand this you know, circuitry. And I have been describing the BLA to ADBNC projection as a single arrow, but it really is a very, uh, it, it, it really are, they are, <coughs> two different circuitry um, pathways, striatal terminalis and ansapiron clearis pathway. So how do these pathways exactly look like, and what roles do they, do they serve? So these are all important questions that I would like to ask in the future. But um, I'm loading a movie now. So let me show you a movie. This is a clarity processed, optically cleared mouse brain that is injected with AV carrying GFP into the BLA. Now the perfusion was done after a year of injection, so it's kind of messy. But you can still see a lot of GFP positive neurons in the BLA. And this fibers pathways th that goes around the stratum and striking down to the bed nucleus of the striatal terminalis here. That's the striatal terminalis pathway. And we can also see this ventral stream of pathways here. Um, this is called the ansapiron clearis pathway. So this cloud example to me first finally taught me how these torturous neural pathways actually look like. And, um, so it was good. And um, in principle, if we zoom in to the data set after high resolution imaging, we should be able to trace individual axon fibers. So if you can see all that relevant circuits in 3D in the whole brain perspective at synaptic resolution, if we can perform molecular phenotyping of the neurons of interest and trace their axons and branches, so I realized that to answer all the questions that I've raised in the previous slide, it will be extremely important to have a solid anatomical and structural information that complements the functional approaches. So that led me to Kwan Munzab, and he's the inventor of Clarity. So I, I shortly mentioned in the beginning, but Clarity is a technique that renders an intact unsectioned biological tissue transparent and permeable to macromolecule. And it preserves overall structural information um, as well as fine structural details such as membrane localized proteins, dendritic spines, and presynaptic and postsynaptic puncti, and small neurotransmitter molecules like GABA. To be able to see molecular and structural features in transparent brain, obviously we need to label the target. And this is a one milli millimeter thick thion EYP mouse brain tissue that is immunostaining against parvobumin and GFAP. So clarity processed tissue is more permeable to macromolecules, so it allows immunostaining in samples thicker than conventional micron thin sections, which is already useful for many purposes. However, immunostaining um, in whole brain still took several, several weeks to months because passive diffusion of antibody molecules is just inherently slow. So we explored the ways of facilitating transport of probe molecules, such as applying um, electric field. But soon we met another problem, because the antibody antigen binding reaction happens within a second. No matter how we fast deliver the antibodies into the tissue, all antibodies get caught up by the antigens near the surface, yielding this non-uniform stating pattern. So unless these two fundamental problems are addressed, unless these time scales for antibody transport and antibody antigen reaction are matched, conventional immunostochemistry cannot be scaled up to study thick tissues, unsectioned tissues. 
So we explore the ways of facilitating um, transport of macromolecules while um, at the same time slowing down the reaction kinetics. And in the technique that we have been developing, dubbed E-Tango, we could selectively facilitate the transport of antibody molecules and slow down the reaction kinetics uh, to address this problem. So we are still developing and optimizing the devices, buffers, and many other parameters. But here is a representative result that shows the good pr proof of concept. So this is a Taiwan EGFP mouse brain that is stained against EGFP. So green is the genetically overexpressed molecules, and red is the antibody signal. And you can see pretty <coughs> almost perfect um, complete and uniform staining throughout the entire brain. And sorry for my slow computer. So, yeah, anti JP antibody that's conjugated with alexafluoride. This is another example. On, this is another mouse brain that is on the same uh, Taiwan EJP e e mouse stain against anti JP, uh, but it, we image this more higher resolution so that we can see the molecular, you know, cell cellular details. So if we zoom into the layer five of the cortex, we can see sparse. JFP neurons all labeled. And if you go to CA1 pyramidal you know, neurons, yeah, it's denser but still well stained. And this is the den densest area in this image, um, dentate gyrus granule cells. Yeah, again, we can see pretty complete staining. And if you go down to the thalamus, their GFP expression is pretty weak here. Um, but we can amplify the signal using the um, E-Tango. So this could be useful for many other purposes. And these images show that immunostaining is uniform and complete in all regions examined in the fiber. Um, neurons and fibers in different regions and depth were successfully stained. And we also apply the E-Tango to endogenously expressed um, proteins. So unlike genetically expressed, overexpressed GFP, uh, in thyroid driver lines, most cellular proteins are expressed in a smaller amount and therefore require more sensitive indirect immunostaining requiring primary and secondary antibodies. So we applied E-Tango to both primary and secondary antibodies and we were able to st stain the histone and tyrosine hydroxides throughout the whole brain. Now this is a cropped image from the midbrain and you can see the dopaminergic neurons and the midbrain structures. And we were able to count all the so number of cells just by simply putting a threshold on the intensity. Now, because the signal intensity is uniform throughout the whole brain, it was just really easy to quantify the cells automatically without recruiting um, sophisticated algorithm to compensate for signal loss over the depth. So we also applied um, E-Tango to um, this, you know, another brain, and you know, this is parvovuminous staining uh, in Taiwan EGFP mouse brain. And we inter interestingly noted that there are some parvovumin positive neurons that are pyramidal cells. So here we can see obviously a very prominent apical dendrite, and numerous basal dendrites, high density of um, dendritic spines, and at one axon terminal going down to the external capsule. So definitely characteristic of pyramidal neurons. And this was actually reported by a Japanese group a few years ago, but. Uh, it was thought to be extremely rare, but according to our counting, there seems to be a pretty abundant amount of um, neurons. So this is insular cortex and entorhinal cortex. Yep. So th I think this is a good example um, that illustrates how E-Tango can be used to kind of rediscover this underrepresented um, cell types. So our current goal is to fine tune the techniques and uh, for general applicability and to integrate structural, molecular, and functional information to comprehensively understand the brain function and dysfunction. And it certainly aligns the goal that I presented at the end of the optogenetics part, but approaching from the anatomy side. So with these tools, obviously there are so many circuits to study. Just to give you some example, let me go back to the anxiety summary slide. So I've 
talked about amygdala in the BNST, but I really did not talk about ventral BNST and difference of nuclear, nuclear of the um, amygdala that are also implicated to in, in anxiety processing and, and so substantia nominata as well. And there are numerous um, cortical and hippocampal and thalamic regions that communicate with all of these structures. And there are so many other downstream structures that mediate the individual components of the anxiety expressions. And obviously, we have never talked about neuropeptides. We really need to record from all of these structures from behaving mice to understand which, as, at which time point each of these structures come to play to shape the behavior. And we don't know the molecular markers or pharmaco you know, for, for the pharmacological interventions. So um, yeah, we have a lot to study. That's, that's the message that I would like to say. And obviously, anxiety is just a part of the brain function. It, there, it interacts with many different systems, like reward system and feeding system and bodily responses, for example. And this is important because anxiety disorders show high comorbidity with addiction, depression, or eating disorders. So yeah, if all of these goals are achieved, we'll, we'll, have, we'll be living in a much better world. So. Um, yeah, with that, I would like to close my talk. And I am deeply indebted to so many talented people, especially Carl, Casey, and um, Kay, and Avi. And um, yeah, all the, all the people that, who helped me and, and the projects. That, uh, these have been a really great, you know, exciting collaborations and took a lot of efforts of a lot of people. So, and thanks to all of those people and mice. Thank you. <laughs>I guess that's an interesting, the question is whether um, optogenetically induced anxio, anxi anxious animal does anything aggressive to other uh, non-perturbed folks. Yeah, I guess that's an interesting question, but we have never tested that. We should, we should talk. All right. Uh, other questions? Okay, I, I guess we can close the talk then. Or, yeah. <laughs>